January the 20th, 1973, going on way back, the U.S. Supreme Court decided that in the Roe v. Wade case would legalize abortion over striking state laws. And in this unprecedented ruling, it, it began an all-out assault, a cultural war in our country for over 50 years. And then, a month ago, on June the 24th, 2022, the Supreme Court, in a 5-4 to four decision, overturned Roe v. Wade, giving the individual states the power to set their own laws. Now, I, I don't know about you, but I'm wondering, how should we respond? How should we as Christians respond? How should we as the church respond? Because as a pastor... I look back, and I see how people respond. And I've seen people respond in one or two ways. Now, there are some Christians in some churches that are silenced into fear. They're silenced into fear. They're, they're scared of, uh, of, of political upheaval and, and trying to divide over this issue. These churches retreat. They don't try to ruffle any feathers. But in so doing... They are unconsciously supporting an area they may not want to support. Or they are unconsciously declaring the insignificance of an issue that may, in fact, be very significant. And then I've seen people or Christians or churches, uh, they, they scream in rage and retribution. They, they look at this issue, and then they'll take Scripture, and they weaponize Scripture, and they uh, demonize culture as the, the whore of Babylon. And, and rather than using Scripture as a medicine of healing and redemption, they use Scripture as a, as a weapon to demonize and destroy and destruct. I believe there's a third approach. I, I believe that the biblical approach is a different approach. There's a third approach that I believe that's going to drive our conversation. How do we discuss this issue in a sound, logical, philosophical, and spiritual way that we just open up the opportunity to have a dialogue? We strip away the, the cultural emotion of this topic, and let's just start with the Bible. And see what the Bible says in terms of what we now should believe and how should we now respond. And so with that question, I think it takes us to Ephesians chapter 6, verse 12. And this is a brilliant scripture. And I believe there, there has to be a qualifying biblical principle that will drive our conversation. And I believe this qualifying biblical principle should drive all of our conversations that we ever have this side of heaven. Because this was the principle that drove the Apostle Paul who lived in a world where Christians were tortured on the daily. That Christians were per persecuted on the moment. And Paul says this in Ephesians chapter 6, verse 12. Listen to what he says. This is amazing. He says, for our struggle is not against what? Our struggle is not against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, the, the authorities. He's referring to the spiritual powers of darkness, the spiritual realm. Against the powers of this dark world and against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly realm. In other words, Paul's saying, listen, know the fight that you are fighting for. Know which battlefield to show up at. And many of you are showing up on the wrong battlefield with the wrong ammunition with the wrong enemy. 
and there is only one enemy. His name is Satan, the master of confusion and lies. And so the enemy in this conversation, every conversation, it's not people, but the principles of darkness. Now, he could have said, I mean, think about Paul's life, right? I mean, he is in a situation under a Roman ruler who is burning Christians for fun. And he says, look, even the Roman emperor is not my enemy. There is one enemy. And this enemy is spiritual. So when we choose to fight, know who we are fighting against. Christ over culture. Compassion over condemnation. But consider this verse. I mean, this is an unprecedented verse that should lead our conversation. And I, I want our conversation, let's just be sober for a moment. Let's begin with what I want to call the ultimate fundamental question when it comes to Roe v. Wade. The ultimate fundamental question. Everything that we believe in, every way we respond to this issue stems from this very important fundamental question. You ready? Here's the question. When does life begin and what response does that require of me? Really? When does life begin? And what response does that require of me? Really? This is the foundational, formative question, whether you are pro-life or pro-choice. So here's the question. When does life begin? Because the conclusion of this matter must irrevocably mean that logically, medically, ethically, and spiritually, we have to go back to this question. This is the foundation of our entire conversation what is the answer to this question because listen if if the unborn if, if they are merely a cluster of non-viable tissue masses that aren't alive exhibiting no value then conversation's over but listen but if the unborn is a human valuable life like you and me everything changes everything changes including listen I haven't thought about this. Even the way we read the Declaration of Independence changes. Think about how the Declaration of Independence starts. It says, we hold these truths to be self-evident that what? All men are created equal. That they are endowed by their creator with certain unalienable rights. That among these are life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. So are we willing to secure these rights for the priest if they in fact represent life in the womb? That's the question. And that takes us to Psalm 139. So turn to your Bibles, middle of the Bible, just open it up. Uh, you can grab a Bible in front of the pew, in front of you, grab that, Psalm 139. That's We're going to start today, we're going to jump around a little bit in Scripture, but I think what we're doing is we're going to take a journey to asking the sober question. When does life begin? And how does that necessitate a response from me? Psalm 139, starting in verse 13, says this. For you, talking to God, for you created my inmost being. You knit me together in my mother's womb. The psalmist is saying God's creation is intentional. God's creation is immaculate. God's creation is incredible. That a thousand years, about thousands of years before we even had the ability to look inside of the womb and evaluate what was taking place, David is saying, look, my life existed in my mother's womb. That's what he's saying here. My life is existing in my mother's womb. And not only that, if you go back 
and look at Psalm 51 9 it says that we are sinful at the moment of conception that we are sinful at the moment of conception the implication is listen our personhood our identity is fashioned and formed at conception but listen to what what psalms continues to say in verse 14 he says i praise you because what i am fearfully and wonderfully made your works are wonderful i i know that full well my frame was not hidden from you when i was made in the secret place but when i was woven together in the depths of the earth now if you know the creation story you know the psalmist is connecting the creation story with this statement that 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 he was woven together in the depths of the earth this correlates with the creation story and then he says this your eyes verse 16 saw what my unformed body that is that god has sovereignly imbued life value and personhood to you before the formation of your body so what is the biblical definition of personhood and to know that you got to go all the way back to genesis chapter one and if you don't have a good understanding of Genesis chapter 1, you don't really have a good understanding that life is even valuable at all. Because all that we have in this life in terms of intrinsic value comes from Genesis chapter 1. And look at what Genesis 1 27 says. So God created mankind... And what? This is amazing. In his own image. In his own image. In the image of God, he created them. Male and female, he created them. That is that you were handcrafted by the creator of the universe. Of value, respect, love. And honor because you bear the very image of God. Now, this statement separates the Judeo-Christian value system from every other religion that has ever existed. No other religion says that you are made in the image of God. That is, that you have a value of the will. That you have something distinct and unique. And consequently, that's where we find our value from. That's where we find our respect from. This Imago day that you bear the very signature of Creator God. And so, we've seen this in history, haven't we? If you change the definition of personhood, go with me. If you change the definition of personhood, you open up the floodgates of the most evil, abhorrent things that have ever happened in history. You've seen it. I mean, we, we, we've seen things like, uh, you know, uh, we've seen the, the work camps from the Holocaust. We've seen chattel slavery. We've seen genocide. We've seen infanticide. Why? Because... The way we have defined personhood has changed from how God has ordained personhood to be. So here's what Psalm 139 and Genesis 1, this is what that the, the writers are telling us about what is inside the mother's womb. And, and this is it. The mother's womb holds a person known loved and formed by God. That is, a, a mother's womb holds a person that is known, loved, and formed by God. And here's the brilliant reality is that the psalmist had no idea about the science that we have today. 
And yet he talks about the intricacies of what happens in the womb. This is absolutely brilliant. And when we look at science, we see that within two weeks of conception, that we're able to trace a human heart that is beating and circulating blood. Brain waves are seen and hands are formed within four weeks. By, by week eight, babies have a distinct fingerprint, a specific gender, kidney function. They suck their thumb. They can, they can dream. The unborn baby has nerve endings, and the, the unborn baby feels pain and responds to pricks. They have a distinct DNA. By week 12, all of the organs are fully functioning, and the baby can cry. And, oh, by the way, most abortions happen between weeks 10 and weeks 14. And so when it comes to Scripture, this is my barometer as a pastor, as a believer in Jesus. If the Bible is clear on an issue, and the church has stood behind the issue for over 2,000 years, then I'm going to go with that. I'm going to go with that. And I love church history, and you can go back to the first century. I believe there's a document that was written by the apostles. It's called the Didache, the teachings of the apostles. And listen to what the Didache says about this issue. It says, you shall not procedure an abortion nor destroy a newborn child. And then an ancient church father named Tertullian, in in his apology, chapter 9, verse 8, says this, in our case, a murder being once for all forbidden, we may not destroy even the fetus in the womb, while as yet the human being derives blood from other parts of the body for its sustenance. So look, this issue is not an American culture war issue. This issue has been around for thousands and thousands of years. And I love the way Jeremiah puts it. Jeremiah uh, uh, chapter 1 verse 5. You don't have to turn there. Just listen. It says, before I formed you in the womb, I knew you. Before you were born, I set you apart. Now this word formed in Hebrew relates to the idea of a potter forming and fashioning the clay that God is designated even the preborn for his glory, for our good. And so Jeremiah here is obviously not distinguishing between the postborn and the preborn. He's not making any lines of distinction. Now, I know, you know, most of you are saying, okay, Chad, I get it, I got it, I, I knew the verses, I get it. And, you know, if you're watching online, you're watching a Southern Baptist church in the deep south with a white boy with blonde hair. So you're not surprised at this. But let's get real to the emotional component of this. Because at the end of the day, that's what's sensitive about the issue. These are issues that, that bring forth emotion that no other issue brings forth and and i'll just say i'm willing as a pastor to have the conversation to pray with you to go before the throne of grace and ask what god's sovereign will is i'm not i'm not saying that look you know this does not have emotional weight to it But I I do want to talk about the science to this because we've talked about what the Scripture says. I just want to talk real quickly, briefly, about what science says about this issue. Um, Science, fortunately, we don't have to spend very long with this question because uh, the good news is that secular biologists, pediatricians, all agree on this issue. In fact, listen to what the American College of Pediatricians says. They They say, we concur with the body of scientific evidence that human life begins at conception, fertilization. The the difference between the individual 
in its adult stage and its zygotic stage is not one of what? Personhood, but one of development. So science and scripture unequivocally agree. They're saying the exact same thing. And so, what about some exceptional issues that may, for the most part, many of us have had to deal with? What, what, what about the case of physical abuse? Or what if there are genetic issues found in, in the womb or the mother's life is at risk? And you know, I can remember when, you know, before we had Satch and, and Baxter that, that the doctor came to us and wanting to do genetic testing and we said, hey, just want you to know we believe in the sovereignty of God and no matter what happens that we, we just truly believe that God knows best. And, and, uh, and so what, what about these situations and and I know I don't have time to go into great detail, but here's what I want to encourage you to do, is to listen and weep with those who are weeping and hurting. But here's what I don't want you to do. I don't want you to take the exceptions as proof to apply it to all of normative examples. Because the reality is that in those exceptional examples those make up less than one percent of all abortions we're talking less than one percent i mean when you look at the statistics they're heartbreaking in in fact 75 percent of all down syndrome of of preborn children end in abortion compared to 18 percent and i don't know about you but Those are the most joyful people on the planet. And that just, that breaks my heart. And so every counter argument that supports pro-choice really boils down to one statement, if we're honest. One justifiable, allegedly justifiable statement, and they suggest this. The right to choose is more important than the right to life. At the end of the day, that is the other alleged justification. And we know this is true because here's what statistics tell us. 85% of all abortions are from people who are not married. 85%. 45% of abortions are from uh, for people um, who have already had an abortion. All right, And these statistically uh, are, are saying that the right for my... Choice matters more than the right to someone else's life. That's what it boils down to. So here's the question. How do we respond? How how do we respond? How do we practically respond to this issue? Number one is, uh, is a verse that I think we should use to respond to every issue. And uh, 1 Peter 2.17 says this. Number one, show proper respect to everyone Love the family of believers. Fear God. Honor the emperor. That's what Peter says. And oh, by the way, the emperor that Peter's talking about was burning Christians at the stake. The second way we're going to respond, and this, this should be our goal when it comes to this issue. You ready? To make abortion unimaginable and unthinkable. To make abortion unimaginable and unthinkable. In other words, listen. Our goal as a church is not merely to change legislation. Our goal as a church is what? To change hearts. Change hearts. That's why we say we exist to inspire everybody to know Jesus and make him known. Not merely to change legislation. Listen, go with me. It is is a viably possible world that Roe v. Wade was reversed and next year we may have more abortions. If Planned Parenthood closed their doors 
and a scientist created a pill that you could take that you don't even have to go to have an abortion. Our world is so broken. You cannot legislate behavior. The church is in the business of changing desire. Not behavioral modification. Now, I am advocate number one. The right decision was made. But I just want us to simply step back and say, you know what? We don't, you know, take our cookies and celebrate and have a party and say, we won! No. No. Now is the time to step up. And to answer the call, this is what God has called us to do. Now that we, by God's grace, will hopefully have more children that are born, we've got to ask the question, what now should we do? If we just respond intellectually, but not with our hands, then do we even have a conviction around this issue? Do we? I reached out to a couple friends in Oxford one at First Baptist Church, and we, uh, Kelly and I have a friend at North Oxford Baptist Church. And they are in partnership with the Pregnancy Resource Center of Oxford. I spent a lot of time on the phone this week talking to their staff, and I want you to see just some of the work that they're able to do straight up the road in Oxford. So check out real quick this video. Hi, my name is Carrie, and one of my favorite places in Oxford, Mississippi is the Pregnancy Center of Oxford. The Pregnancy Center of Oxford is a safe, non-judgmental resource for pregnant women and girls. Believing that every life is made in the image of God, regardless of the circumstances, our greatest mission is to offer life-affirming choices to abortion-vulnerable women through compassionate consultation and ultrasound. We also give help and hope to all women by offering a free pregnancy test and ultrasound, friendly consultations, and prenatal labor, delivery, and parenting classes. Many women we serve are uninsured and are not able to receive medical care until their Medicaid is established. Our free services offer verification of pregnancy and peace of mind to expected mothers while they wait to see a doctor. We offer each client free prenatal vitamins and enroll them in prenatal classes on their first visit so she can begin to make safe and healthy choices for herself and her growing baby. Because of the pandemic, we now offer our classes online. It has proven to be a huge success. And while we hope to bring back some in-person classes, we know the value of virtual learning for busy women and families. We will continue to provide free online classes to expectant mothers and their families. To support our moms, we keep an abundance of diapers, diaper bags, wipes, new clothing, and even car seats at our center. We give these out to our expectant moms as they complete their classes. One of the gems of our ministry is this fantastic children's clothes closet. We welcome all families to shop in our clothes closet. We keep it fully stocked with gently used seasonal clothing year round. This is a great resource for foster parents too. So come see us and spread the word. Everything is free. Would you consider partnering with us? The cost of our services, including an ultrasound, is over $400 per client. $50 a month will sponsor one client for one year. $100 a month will sponsor two. $250 a month will sponsor five clients for one year. Special interest donation to client supplies, ultrasound, or education are a great way to support us, too. And when you need to honor a loved one, please consider us with your honorariums or memorial donations. We always need baby supplies. And you can visit our website at www.pregnancyoxford.org to find our shopping list. We hope you will partner with us.
And before you know it, this can be one of your favorite places too. I know God has called me to get connected. And uh, we were connected at a pregnancy resource center in Georgia. And I feel like we have to be connected. Amanda's already responded to me and invited me to their dinner at First Baptist in Oxford. And I don't know how God's calling you to respond. I just know that if we really believe life begins at conception, we will respond. And I just want to celebrate Doug Summerford and Jim Dobbs and Laurie and Christy. And they're part of the Fathers in the Field ministry here. And we've been, we met last week. We're meeting tomorrow. We've got some possibilities. We want to put our feet to our faith. Why? Because, listen, 75% of abortions are from impoverished situations. And listen to this. 75% of those abortions, the ladies would say, I would have the child if I had these resources. Now is the time to provide the resources. Can you pray with me? With heads bowed.